Most of Mythic Plus does not come down to throughput until the most like highest, highest, highest key level. 98% of key levels, it, it's all about preventing your group from getting destroyed by preventable damage. A lot of people underestimate how much UI actually impacts your gameplay. Generally speaking, the meta is completely irrelevant until you hit one or two key levels below the world first key levels. Healer damage in the grand scheme of things is actually not that important in 95% of key levels. And, and that's part of why a lot of times when people are like learning healing, I tell them, okay, spend a week playing in pugs. This is kind of the difficult part. WoW is full of introverts. A lot of people who aren't super social. That is how I built up a huge roster of friends and how eventually I broke into the like world first key pushing. The main thing for me was was hunting DPS that played for the group, not for themselves. The idea about keys depleting and dropping a level is kind of punishing to the majority of the player base. Yikes. <laughs> I was worried you are going to ask oh, me this. Sheesh. This is the weekly MMO podcast Unplugged. Very special guest today, Alice Mir. Um, I've actually been lurking in your stream since BFA when it was a sea of resto druids and you were the only holy paladin in, in the ladder. Um, but I'll, let, I'll turn it over to yourself. Um, obviously, you know, I think a lot of people know you as the rank one healer for multiple seasons, but why don't you introduce yourself? Uh, what's up, guys? My name is Alice Mir. Um, my real name's Kendall. And I, yeah, I am a Mythic Plus healer. It's what I'm mostly known for. I also played in the Race to World First for many tiers with BDG and was a member of the Golden Guardians. Um, and yeah, I'm just here to chat with you guys about Mythic Plus, healing, and everything WoW related. Perfect. Um, so I think let's just start with with something really simple. I think there's lots of people who, you know, Dragonflight's great, Mythic Plus is, is kind of fun again versus Shadowlands. And I think a lot of people are also looking to climb the ladder. And you have been playing at the very top of your game for the longest time now. Um, on hindsight, you know, like what kind of advice would you have got, like given yourself if you were starting Mythic Plus all over again as a new player, as a healer, like anything on hindsight now that you have that experience under your belt, what would you say to your younger self if you want to get better? Um, if I was trying to get better quicker as a healer, specifically in M+, I would definitely suggest focusing more on UI improvements and on, um, because a lot of people underestimate how much UI actually impacts your gameplay, especially in Mythic Plus. Uh, as a healer, like getting your UI to the perfect spot uh, and making your interface like exactly what works well for you with, you know, whether it's weak auras or add-ons or whatever it might be, uh, it makes a very, very big difference in gameplay, oftentimes much more of a difference than anything that you can do, like, rotationally because the truth is that a lot of rotate like a lot of these specs rotationally are not super complicated a lot of what m plus is about is about reacting quickly uh you know making sure that you're triage healing correctly so you know exactly who needs to be healed when and a lot of that comes down to being able to see when mechanics are coming out when certain casts are coming out um like who in your party is most in danger of you know dying to any given mechanic at any given time and always thinking a few steps ahead. And a lot of that is helped significantly by a good UI. Mm -hmm. So I think that would be one of the most important things that I would have focused on more early on in my career, because I didn't really start mastering that until a few years in. You know, I, I know you've created a great resource, which is, you know, Wings is up. And I think your frontal weak aura is probably the most used in Mythic class <laughs> I've seen. Um, very iconic, like AWP sound from, from Counter Strike, I think. But um, what's the best way people can kind of like, you know, look into your resources? Is it uh, through Wings is Up? Like what's the best way people can get access to kind of, you know, your resources? So I have a lot of publicly available resources, um, both on Wings is Up. And also if you just go to Wago, so wago.io is where everybody gets their week orders from. And if you go to there, you can find my profile on Wago, and it has every public week where I've ever uploaded there. And you can just kind of scroll through them and see the ones that you like. Right. And yeah, the frontal one is <laughs> is very fun. It's uh, it actually like several years ago, back in Uldir, which was I don't I want to say almost six years ago. Um, there was a boss boss called Mithrax, mm. and Mithrax had this giant frontal. And uh, our raid kept getting hit by it. And so somebody in our raid, as a joke, put that 
really loud gunshot yep. sound effect uh, for the frontal and created a weak aura and everybody used it. And after that, nobody got hit by the frontal. And I was like, wait, that's actually not a bad idea. It's an obnoxious sound, but it's really effective, especially as like a melee healer when you have a lot of other things to focus on uh, or just even as any melee at all. Uh, it's it's very effective for <laughs> for dodging frontals, which is why I think it became pretty popular. 100%. I think like you have saved so many keys from being bricked just from your week or so, you know, on behalf of the community. Thank you for your service. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and you mentioned something interesting. You mentioned like melee healer, right? Because obviously you made a holy paladin. And I, you know, I would love to pick your brains on this. Um, you know, you have played at the highest levels. For people out there who are looking to play a healer, like how much does meta specs really matter? And versus like, you know, choosing what you like to play and will your answer change depending on whether the person is new to Mythic Plus or whether they're trying to push the highest keys? In my opinion, every video game ever is meta-gamed. And the more competitive you want to be, the more people push the meta on you. The reality is that the meta is largely irrelevant until you hit extremely high key levels. Now, sometimes that's not always the case because sometimes there's a massive gap in the meta between uh generally that has to do with tanks and healers like sometimes there is one or two tanks that are like far and away better than the rest or like one or two really really bad tanks and then same goes for healers but outside of those like niche extreme examples generally speaking the meta is completely irrelevant until you hit reasonably high keys so what i mean by that is like one or two key levels below the world first key levels that's like a general good rule if you're one or two key levels below the world first key levels then you probably need to start metagaming at least to a certain extent like you can't just walk in there with like five of the worst specs in the game and you'll probably get your ass handed to you but i i think that in general metagaming has gotten a little extreme where like people believe that they need meta comps in really in like every single key level. And the truth is that it doesn't really make much of a difference. You should generally bring the player, not the spec, up until you hit a key level where you actually need to bring the player and the spec. And that's, that's uh, but again, that's not until one or two key levels below world first key level. Um, yeah, I like that. Like this season, yeah. Like this season, there's, there's extreme examples. Like Holy Paladin uh, as a healer is so far below other healers throughput wise that you would struggle in even medium keys or like uh, as a tank, you know, if you're playing brewmaster, you would struggle significantly, uh, you know, but that's like, that's this season. I'm every season. There are examples of that and it changes every season, but typically speaking, yeah, the, the meta is largely irrelevant for the majority of the player base. Right. And, and speaking about, you know, Holy Paladins, and I know like we can go into that later versus like Miss Weaver and where it is right now. But, um, you know, I remember a time in, in BFA where, again, referencing what I said at the start, you know, everyone was playing a Wrestle Druid and I think you were easily like contending and you're know, facing off against, you know, Wrestle Druids as a Holy Paladin. So in that in that kind of world where you're playing an off-meta spec and kind of still doing the highest keys, what was that mentality like? Like how does that make you feel, um, you know, just, just kind of championing like the Holy Paladin flag right there. Like how does that make you feel? It was definitely fun and I do love trying to do off meta stuff. However, that being said, that season, while everybody was defaulted to Resto Druid, uh, I do think that HPAL was still very good. It's just one of those circumstances where like Resto Druid was slightly better in some cases and Holy Paladin was slightly better in others. Like Holy Paladin could bring more damage, whereas Resto Druid was more of a utility and healer, like healing throughput spec. And um I think that part of the fun of off meta gaming is like figuring out what your spec brings to the table and how you can capitalize on it so that uh, you still have a, there's still a reason to bring you, right? There always needs to be a reason to bring your spec over another spec and every spec has its own niche, right? So this season, for example, if you're looking to bring Mistweaver, then you, you're looking for like raw healing throughput. Mm. If you're looking for Restodruid, you're looking for more like single target active damage, which is what they excel at right now, plus um, good consistent group healing and Mark of the Wild raid buff. You know, if you're looking to bring Priest, then 
you'd be looking for PI if you don't have a Shadow Priest in your group or, you know, Stam buff. Every, every healer brings something unique and you need to have a reason. You need to give people a reason to bring you over the meta spec. And for me, at least that's that's how it is in like in hierarchies. Like I said, when you have to start metagaming in, in the highest key levels, you have to have a reason to bring your spec over a meta spec if you want to be in those groups. And so for me, that season in particular, uh, you know, back in BFA season three and four, both of those seasons, I gave the reason that my Holy Pally could do significantly more damage than Resto Druids could. And that helped us time keys a lot faster. And uh, we could do that without sacrificing group survivability, which was the big like concern was that because Resto Druid was the better throughput healer. Um, but yeah, so I think... For me, a lot of the fun came down to like figuring out a way to min-max a spec so much that I actually had a, a reason, I gave my group a reason to bring a Holy Pally over a Resto Druid. Right, and, and you mentioned, you know, like the, the idea of putting out more damage and, and also kind of being able to cope with the throughput that's needed at the highest keys. Like just how important is healer damage at, you know, the keys that you're doing at your level? Like how important is, is healer damage? So healer that. damage in the grand scheme of things is actually not that important in 95% of key levels. People put a lot of emphasis on it, and I understand why. It's actually really fun. Uh, one of the things I find most fun about healing is figuring out ways to min-max your damage while doing a lot of healing, uh, like without sacrificing group survivability. And part of that, it just comes down to learning how to triage heal um, and learning, you know, when do I have, when can I find, so I'm trying to figure out the best way to put it, but basically if your group is at 60% health, but you know the damage events that are coming and you know that there's not another damage event for the next 20 seconds, right? Uh, then you know that you can allow, every healer has some form of passive healing and you know that you can allow passive healing and specs leech and all that kind of stuff you can allow your group to sit at 60% health without actively healing them and just allow the passive healing to go until the next damage event hits. And one of the things I find that players that struggle to min-max their damage in keys, one of the biggest things I find is that they're focused on topping people instantly when, they, mm. when their health drops uh, without actually paying attention to like, is there immediate danger to these players or not? Because if there's not you can get away with just doing a lot of damage instead of healing them because they're going to get healed up by the next damage event anyways. So that's kind of like the big step that you would take to, if you were looking to min-max your damage, is learning those damage events, knowing when exactly your group is in danger or not. And of course, a lot of that gets easier when you're not pugging because mm -hmm. when you're pugging, the damage events can be a lot more sporadic because stuff can go wrong very easily. People can miss kicks, all that kind of stuff. So when you're pugging, you do have to be more aggressive with making sure that people are topped but when you're in a more coordinated group with people that you play with often and there's like expectations of what should be interrupted and and you learn damage events as a group much better then you can really really work on min maxing your damage a lot more right. but in regards to what you were saying with like how much is min maxing healer damage relevant in the first place mm -hmm. The truth is that it's generally not super relevant in a lot of key levels. In the world first key levels, it really depends on the season. Some seasons, you really do need to min-max your damage a lot because the, the key timers come down to the wire. They come down to, you know, there's only a few seconds left even when you play perfectly. Right. And in those types of keys, your healer does need to min-max their damage a lot. But there's also seasons like this season currently mm. where healer damage is largely irrelevant because um it's just about surviving this, I guess. yeah this season it's way more about survivability and making sure that your team doesn't die because there are so many one-shot mechanics and there are like blizzard kind of tuned the damage events too high relative to the health of the mobs and bosses so we have dungeons barely being timeable because of the damage events but you're still, if you can live them, then you're timing these keys with like a minute or two left. Right. So like for that reason, this season, 
healer damage is much less relevant than it has been in the past. So I would say that he, the relevance and importance of min-maxing healer damage is very dependent on the season, on the dungeon tuning, and on your group. And and I know that, you know, having looked in your stream, I know you have lots of views about, you know, how a fixer should be changed going forward. And we will circle back to that. Um, but before that, I think you brought a good point, which is playing in parks versus with a, you know, kind of like a fixed group. It's kind of different. Um, for for people out there, I think majority of people are still doing their keys in, in pretty much parks. For healers like that who are, you know, trying to push their key levels and whatnot, how, how would you think about like cooldown management as a healer? Like, because obviously you don't have that vocal comms with, with your group and you know it's, it's parks right like would would your mentality dif be different going to parks um, let's say you're doing a key on stream and it's a punk group H how do you think about it differently as a as a healer so when you're in a coordinated group a lot of the times like you have a set plan of exactly what you do every time and so it's much more mapped out it's like mythic raiding right when you when you prog a mythic raided raid boss with your guild you start learning exactly where to press your cooldowns you learn where other people are pressing theirs and you pull the boss enough times that you have you you just get into a rhythm and you always do the same thing and it's very scripted so when you get into the highest world first key levels that's very similar a lot of the highest world first key levels are very scripted and very, very well practiced. And everybody kind of presses the same thing and it's pretty mapped out and planned. Uh, in pugs, it's definitely completely different. You have to throw all of that out the window. So playing in pugs versus playing in a coordinated group is a completely different game. And part of the reason, and, and that's part of why a lot of times when people are like learning healing or they want to get better at healing, I tell them, okay, spend a week playing in pugs. Mm -hmm. Don't play in, a, in your group take a little break from playing with your group and just get into pugs because you learn a lot of reactionary, uh, you learn how to react to different situations much faster and you learn how to like use every button in your kit to, you know, maybe you need to stun something or blind something or kick something that you wouldn't normally need to kick. And you just gain a lot of awareness when you pug versus like, it's easy when you're in a coordinated group, when you're in like your set group, it's kind of easy to just uh, go through the motions and go on autopilot. But when you're pugging, you can't do that. And, and so it's actually, it's really, really good for you to pug and to kind of develop that, uh, that part of your gameplay, that reactionary part of your gameplay. Yeah. Um, in terms of how you manage your cooldowns, you want to make sure that you're never committing too many things at once. Every healer has multiple cooldowns to go through. And if you just blow them all when the first damage event happens, you're going to be screwed coming up. So part of pugging is knowing damage events, like I was talking about earlier with min-maxing healer damage. Even if you're not min-maxing healer damage, knowing, like learning the damage events of dungeons, what does damage, what doesn't, where you could kick or stop or do whatever to mitigate a lot of damage. That's hugely important for both proactive healing and reactionary healing. And like proactive healing is when you know it's coming and so you set up your healing. And then reactionary is when something happens that you did not expect to happen and then you have to react to it by pressing, you know, a, a cooldown that you otherwise wouldn't have had to press. So it's really important that you know all of the dangers and you're ready for anything when you go into pugs. And it's also important to remember that sometimes stuff's just going to go wrong. Like things will, things will go wrong. Things will become a fiesta very quick and that's okay. You know, mm -hmm. you, it, one of the things I really try to stress on people is like, especially if you're pugging as a healer, you need to be mentally prepared for shit to go wrong and not just blame yourself all the time because it's really easy, especially in this community, for healers to take the brunt of the blame mm -hmm. for everything. And it's important that you recognize what you could have done to do better, but also that everything just isn't your fault by default, you know? Right. No, that's, um, that's a good point about like the mental game and whatnot. And, and I definitely want to pick your brains more on like the mental game. Um, but I kind of want to ask you as well, because you mentioned about like learning damage patterns of like dungeons for the season and whatnot. And, and once they kind of learn that, like, is there a kind of a need to learn, you know, when it comes to playing with different tanks, right? Different tank specs, like, do they need to come down to the nuance of like, okay, a blood decay is, is being healed differently from, you know, a brewmaster versus a warrior. Like, 
um, how how important is that to know you know each tank specs and you know their damage patterns and their mitigations and whatnot? I think um, it kind of depends on the season because recently tanks have become so self survivable that you very rarely heal them at all um, outside of like the passive healing that your spec does. And so it's, it really depends on the season because that hasn't always been the case. Sometimes, for example, I think it's more important that you are aware of tank mitigation and when their mitigation is going to drop. And that's when you want to either watch their healing, uh, like watch, you might need to throw them some extra healing, throw them some hots, or you might need to use an external on them, like, you know, pain suppression, blessing of sacrifice, bark skin, stuff like that. Um, and what I mean by mitigation is like uh, the, the tanks defensives tanks have active mitigation and then they've got uh, which is like, you know, for a demon hunter, it's stuff like demon spikes or fiery brand. It's things that reduce the damage that they take. And uh, every tank has a set of ro like rotational defensives as well as like major defensive cooldowns. And what you need to watch for is if either a there uh, it's when their rotational defensives are running out and they don't have a major cooldown to press. And if both of those drop, that means they either need a lot of healing or they need an external. And so it's important for you to know what each tank's mitigation abilities are and for you to track those on their frames. So you can always make sure that if there's ever a gap that you're well aware that there's a gap. And that's more relevant in pugs because in if you're in a coordinated group, obviously your tank should be like communicating that with you and being like, I need an external here, you know. But if you're in a pug, you don't get that a lot of the times, especially if you're not in voice. And so you, especially for healers that pug a lot, you definitely need to be watching for tank mitigation and learning each tank's mitigation patterns and when that tank would need help. So for example, like Blood DK, you need to watch if they're out of their major cooldowns and their um, resources are low. If they don't have enough resources, then they're not going to be able to death strike. And if they can't death strike, they're just going to die. Uh, so that's really, really, really something you need to watch for with, with blood decays. Because especially with blood decays, their health just ping pongs so much. Right. Each tank has different damage intake patterns. So like Monk is a very stable uh, intake pattern, right? Because they have stagger. So all the damage that they intake is dealt over time and that makes it a lot easier for healers to know when they're in a lot of danger or not but blood decays are the exact opposite they they take in a huge amount of damage and then heal that back so if for any reason they can't heal that back because they don't have enough runic power then that means they're in a lot of trouble right. so it's just important to kind of learn each tank and where those trouble areas are for them and then watch for that that's, that's a great tip. And I think it goes back to what you said earlier at the start of this kind of interview where you talked about the importance of your UI and just, you know, absorbing information on the screen. And, and that's really helpful. Um, you know, I kind of want to move away from pugs a little because I think you've definitely given a lot of people, you know, some really great tips on pugging. Now, if they want to transit to, you know, kind of starting to play at a different level, right? Playing with a fixed team. I think the first step is always, well, how do I go about, you know, getting to, play a fixed group of players. Um, you know, on hindsight, you know, having been through, you know, the highest key levels and whatnot, and, and, you know, being a really important part of this community and a really prominent figure, like what kind of advice would you give people when it comes to like looking for a set group of people to play with? Like what's, yeah, what are some advice you'll give people here? So this is kind of the difficult part because WoW is full of introverts like me. I am also an introvert and a lot of people who aren't super social and who may have some social anxiety. I, I struggle with that all the time. Um, fortunately, I, while I have a low social battery, I am able to turn on being social and turn off. Uh, so for me, the way that I was able to climb the ranks through the years is back in Legion when M plus first came out. Uh, I was pugging a lot and then I decided I want to kind of take that next step like you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And so what I did was I went on to WoW Progress, which was this this yep. uh, site that people used back before Raider.io or Warcraft Vlogs. I think it still exists. Yeah. Um, but I went on to WoW Progress and I checked the top 
10 blood DKs because blood DK was the, yep. the really, really strong tank back then. I checked the top 10 blood DKs in the US and I went to each one of their profiles on WoW Progress, looked for their battle net and added them on battle net. And then I messaged every single one of them and I was like, I'm looking, you know, I'm a healer. I'm a holy paladin. I'm looking to push higher keys with a coordinated group. Would you be interested in, you know, trying to do some keys together and seeing how we, you know, work, work together. Right. And, you know, seven of them either didn't respond or didn't add me back, but, uh, two of them said yes. And one of them became, uh, one of my closest friends over the years. And, uh, we started playing together every day. And, um, what we did was we would go into LFG, right. we would pug, the other three DPS. Mm -hmm. And anytime we came across a good DPS, we would add them on Battle.net. And uh, eventually we built up a roster of friends on Battle.net full of really good players. And, you know, I had like notes for each one and how I thought each one like played. And then we started putting together teams. And uh, as we continued to play with these players, like it just got... Uh, we, we were able to climb higher and higher because every time we were looking to improve as a group. So it's kind of like my biggest suggestion would be any time that you play with a good player, not only should you be at your best game when you're pugging because you never know who else might be in the group, but also too, you want to make sure that you are you know friendly and kind and get a good rapport with everyone in your group. Like being toxic is going to get you nowhere in this game in terms of like making friends. And if you're trying to climb the ranks, it's all about making friends and connections. Right. So be nice in your groups, play well in your groups. That's the other important part. And finally, don't be afraid to actually reach out to these players that you think are good at the end of the run. Basically at the end of each run that I did, if I ever played with a really good player, I would message them and I'd be like, yo, you were awesome. Do you mind if I add you on Bnet right. so we can do some keys together, you know? And that is how I built up a huge roster of friends and how eventually I broke into the the like world first key pushing right. uh, scene. Oh, that's great advice. And I think the fact that you partnered up with a tank and you know you have your pick of DPS players who sign up, like I think a lot of DPS players will see like, oh, the group is kind of more or less formed with a tank healer, like, you know, that's a promising group. So, you know, lots of supply to choose from. Um, on that front, I would like to ask you, because you have played with the best DPS players in the world. Um, what do you think, uh, like, you know, because when you're going through this trial process of kind of like filtering through people to join your, your team, you know, obviously we have, we have came across um, DPS players who, who, who are all about padding the meters and looking good on the meters. But what are some of like the nuances that you look out for in a good team player? Like, okay, I want to play with this DPS in the long run. Like he is, he or she is part of the team in the long run. Like what are some of the things that you consider? I think for me, um, the biggest things I look for is interrupts and stops. A DPS that knows the dangerous abilities and what they should be in is like very aggressive with interrupting and uh, using their AOE stops or their single target stops or whatever it might be. Most of Mythic Plus does not come down to throughput until the most like highest, highest, highest key level. In general, 95% of key levels, 98% of key levels, it, it's all about CC, mob control, and preventing your group from getting destroyed by uh, preventable damage, basically. And so I think what I really looked for was DPS who were actively trying to interrupt, who were actively, you know, going out of their way to like help the group in and it rarely was I like, oh my god, this player is just an insane throughput player, we should take them. Like, it was always about, okay, what did this player do to help the group survive and get through this key? You know, so like when I see a, a DPS player is really aggressive with helping with afflicted or with in, incorporeal, like with affixes and stuff like that, or, you know, if somebody back in Legion was helping with explosives or whatever it might be, like, I think in general, people place a little bit too much value into throughput. And the best players in the world are the ones that can do throughput when it matters, but don't really care about the meters and mainly focus on 
interrupting, CCing, making sure that everything goes smoothly and according to plan. Because if everything goes smoothly and according to plan, you're going to time the key. Mm. Like you're just going to time the key. That's, that's how keys are every season. Um, it's very rare that it comes down to, oh, I should have min max my damage a little bit more unless you're at like the highest world first key levels. Um, so I think, yeah, the, the main thing for me, it was, was hunting DPS that mm. played for the group, not for themselves. That's great advice. Um, and the other thing that I noticed when you're playing in set groups, and um, you know, it's just the way you communicate with your team. Um, as a healer, like, what are some of the things that you think is important for people who just started getting into a, a fixed team that they play with? What are some of like the communication stuff that they gotta, you know, kind of nail down in terms of being a healer? I think the most important thing is tracking your group's major like group cooldowns, things like mass barrier um, or uh, like immunities or Zephyr, rallying cry, stuff like that. Anything AMZ, it's big group wide defensives. You want to make sure that you track those separate from what you track from like all your other stuff that you track because you need to make sure that you're calling for those in the right spots. Um, and you need to make sure that you have that like mapped, like you need to know, okay, you need to be aware of your cooldowns and you need to be vocal. If you know that damage is incoming soon and you don't have much, you need to tell your group, look, I don't, I don't have anything. You guys need to press something right. <laughs> or, you know, you need to either that, or you need to have your defenses mapped out and you need to like know exactly when people are going to be using their immunities or when they're going to be sending mass barrier or when Zephyr is going to be stuff like that. Like you, you need to make sure that you are vocal with your group about when you are in trouble as a healer so that they can save themselves. Mm. And, Cause a lot of the times people have, you know, DPS specs, they have so many different ways to save themselves, whether it's health pots, defensives, immunities, anything. And a lot of the times I see people just die without any communication whatsoever uh, when the healer knew that they were in trouble. Mm -hmm. And so it's really important that you let your DPS know if you're in trouble. If you're in voice with them, mm -hmm. just say something, you know, and it, it'll it'll go a long way for your group survivability. Right. That, that's helpful. And Shifting gears back into the mental game, because you brought it up earlier. Um, you know, when you're in a set group, I think we have all been there. There are groups that they're just, you know, score hunters, right? Like they, they're just all about timing this current key. But at the same time, I feel like as a group, there's this tricky tension between we want to time the key versus we want to try something new. We want to take risk. We want to learn and potentially fail and break the key. How do you think about that as, you know, someone that has been on, on the world's best teams? Like, yeah, how do you how do you manage that tension? That one is very tricky because the truth is that the mental game is really, really difficult for healers, especially, but also just for, you know, any time that you're pushing keys at a really high level, it's a very competitive scene and it's uh, people get really, really intense. People get a lot of emotions about it because it's. Uh, it can be anxiety inducing and it, it, it's also just like a lot of adrenaline because, you know, that's why a lot of us enjoy pushing these world first keys is like that's we, we find that to be fun. Uh, but a lot of times with the adrenaline and, you know, anxiety and stuff and like stress um, comes a lot of uh, struggles in terms of communication with the group and like people can get nasty towards each other people can get you know frustrated with each other and whether or not your group survives that comes down to how you handle that communication mm. and i think that's where a lot of groups fail and understandably so if you look at m plus like the high key scene in general and the teams that play together it's very very rare that you see teams last more than like a year mm. like teams change constantly and the reason for that is because uh it's very difficult managing all these players that you know and and in the heat of the moment like people can say nasty stuff right. and then yeah so i think a lot of it comes down especially as a healer like you can you can only do so much you know and i think a lot of it is about focusing on yourself and making sure that when things do go wrong that you react as well as you can right so making sure that you don't, you know, immediately try to blame others. That's like a big thing that that's not going to get you anywhere. It's important that you 
when things do go wrong, that you as a team look over what went wrong. And it's okay to be like, you know, this person didn't do this. And that's what went wrong. That's fine. But what's not okay is like, you know, yelling at the person and and making them feel terrible. And you know, that's the kind of stuff that you have to watch out for. That's the kind of stuff that's going to leave long lasting uh, issues that are going to fester. So it's important that you figure out a way to address mistakes as a group in a healthy manner. Mm. And a lot of that, yeah, a lot of that is going to be aimed at the healer initially. Like that's just the reality of wow. A lot of blame instantly. yeah. (laughs) Yeah. A lot of blame instantly gets placed on the healer because that's just how the game works. Mm. Um, because somebody dies, it's, sometimes due to lack of healing and it's really easy to default to that but it's important for you after every key this is what i always tell aspiring healers after every single key you want to look at each death and figure out okay was this actually my fault what could i have done to prevent this and try and fix anything that you could have done for next time but don't just beat yourself up over things that were out of your control because there will be a lot of deaths that are out of your control too So it's important to know what things you can control and what things you can't and work on improving the things that you can control, but not hyper fixating on the things that you can't. Right. That's, that's good advice. Um, and you mentioned a bit about, uh, the importance of the mental game and and how, if you just look at groups in mythic plus, like there's kind of a high turnover in terms of team composition. So speaking about that, I think that's a, that's something that a lot of people can relate to as well. There's a set group of people that you tend to play with when they're online. But, you know, every now and then you might get replaced. You might get benched. You know, your tank finds a new healer and just stops inviting you. Like, and, and at moments like this, it could be kind of really demoralizing. Um, what, what advice do you have for people like who are going through that gauntlet of really trying to find the team to play with, right? Let's say you're a set team. Um, you're not online. You, you happen to be out on a Saturday. They invite another healer and they seem to vibe really well. And you just, you're just kind of replaced. Um, what what advice would you give people who are kind of going through that process? That's not an easy situation to be in. It's very difficult and it can for sure take a big mental blow to your, you know, uh, to your ego and to your valuation of yourself as a player. And I think that it's important to remember that not everything is about your performance there are a lot of factors as to why that might happen whether it's you know uh the way that the group interacts with each other or chemistry or there's there's so many different things that could cause that to happen and it's really hard to say which unless the person is pretty vocal and like and tells you why you were replaced um best thing i can say is don't waste your time thinking about what could have been and don't fixate on like, what did I, you know, do to, for this to happen? All you can do is continue to be the best player that you can be and continue to try your best and work on your problem areas. And, you know, that's all that, that's all that you can hope for. And if that's not enough for some groups, then it's probably best for you to find another group anyways. Right. Good advice. Um, diving deeper into this mental game thing. I think one of the things that I also realized about the Mythic Plus community is a lot of people, they kind of fixate on on score and the idea of, you know, every hour I spend in this game, you know, it needs to contribute to my score. And there's almost a mentality of, well, if that key doesn't do me any justice in terms of my score, I'm not going to play the key. Um, As someone who has gone through so many seasons, uh, what do you think about mentality like that? Should, Should people kind of play keys, just sit in group finder, look for keys that give them score? Or should they just kind of practice? Like, what's your thoughts on that? I think it depends on the player and what they're trying to accomplish. Mm. The thing is that, like, there are a lot of situations where I totally understand that. Like, for me, as, like, a hyper-competitive player, obviously, if a key doesn't give score, it's significantly less exciting for me. uh, And I generally play in order to push, like, cutting-edge key levels like that's the enjoyment that i get out of it so i don't think it's fair to like criticize people necessarily and and say that like they shouldn't feel that way and they they should care more about keys that don't give io because 
some people just play the game in order to play at the most competitive level right. or at the most competitive level that they can play at. And that's fine. That's, that's not like, mm -hmm. that's not a negative. And I think that the higher key levels you go, the more you're going to encounter players like this, because that's why people push keys at right. the, that level. There's no incentive to pushing keys at that level outside of IO, mm -hmm. right? So, or, or a score. So I think that that's kind of a tricky, tricky thing to, to, to talk about because I don't want to say that you shouldn't feel like that, but it is also shitty when like your friends want to key with you and, and, or want to key with someone and they don't want to key just because it's not IO, yeah. right? Like that doesn't, that's not fun either. Right. But I, I think that's just the reality of the game is that some people just play to be competitive and other people play because they find keys a lot of fun. I think I land somewhere in between, but I will say that like I do almost always enjoy more competitive keys more than I do the less competitive keys, the keys that I've already done. And I definitely sometimes will just go on autopilot when I'm on keys that I've already done. Uh, that's actually something I've been working on because like homework keys, which is what we call um, key levels that like are that you've already done and you're just doing in order to get another key. Homework keys for me, I, I I tend to kind of zone out. I tend to play a little bit more casually, and then when the like keys that are score, I like super lock in and and you know focus up. And so that's something I've actually been trying to improve on myself and like making sure it's the same thing for me on farm and raid mm -hmm. where you know we're rekilling the same bosses. Like it's really easy to just kind of zone out for players that are really competitive and only really play the game in order to be the best at that they can be it's really easy to kind of zone out on things that they've already done. Um, Cause you don't get that, you know, you don't get that adrenaline. You don't get that, uh, right. that same level of competitive entertainment. So yeah, I think in general, it's important to, if you sign up for a key, if you do a, like you should see it through unless it's like a complete disaster, you shouldn't just be like, you know, oh, one thing went wrong, I'm dipping, you know? Right. Uh, I think that behavior is definitely not cool no matter what type of player you are. If you sign up for a key, that's a commitment and you should respect that unless things are obviously like a complete and total disaster. Like you have 30 deaths in the first five minutes. Right. <laughs> then I get it. <laughs> that's fair game, but, yeah. fair enough. <laughs> yeah, but, it, but in general, yeah, that's, that's kind of how I feel about it. I think that players who only get enjoyment out of being like super competitive, should recognize that that's how they are and not ruin other people's enjoyments of lower keys. Um, so it's important to know what kind of player you are, right. you know, because I, I think, I think some people don't realize that they're like that uh, and, and will ruin other people's keys because of that. Right. Earlier you mentioned that, you know, you're a hyper competitive player. I would just love to get into your mind a little, because I know that it's probably very cutthroat at the high end of the leaderboard. Right. And, and obviously other groups are also pushing keys and whatnot. Like, does that does that stress ever get to you? Like, oh shit, the second the second healer is catching up and, and whatnot. Um, does that stress ever get to you? Um sometimes I think I don't know if I'd call it stress. It's more drive mm, for me. Right. Like I channel I channel that into competitive drive. Mm. Like I I want to be the best. I want to be the best I can be, and I want to be the best in the world. And that's always driven me. Uh and when other healers play better or other healers are, are higher ranked that just gives me more drive to be better and to push higher right and i think that that's the attitude that you have to have i think if you start getting like super stressed out and like feeling really shitty about not being as high of a rank as you could be right. i think that's not going to do you any good i think that's probably just going to be bad for your for your mental and uh yeah Speaking about your mental, like let's let's talk about that. Um, because you mentioned when you play at the highest level, it could be frustrating sometimes. Like it could just be one missed kick and the keys break. How do you recover and reset from moments like that? And sometimes is it just right to just call it a day? Like how do you think about moments like that when you're really tilted? The truth yeah. is, yeah, the truth is a lot of times you can't. A lot of groups will that will happen and they will just mentally crumble and it like keys will if you decide to continue to key you'll just brick like four more keys in a row and everyone's mental will be shot sometimes similar to other like ranked games that you like league of legends or you know whatever it might be sometimes you just need to know that like 
<laughs> your group is tilted. You need a little break. Right. Go eat some food. Go stand up. Go take a walk. Do something. Like shit goes wrong sometimes, and that's okay. That's part of keys. Not it, like no group plays perfectly all the time. The best groups in the world will wipe to the silliest shit imaginable, right. and that's just the way it goes. Mm -hmm. That's why you get the key back. You spend the time to get the key back, and then you uh, you run it again. Right. And so it's important that you remember that shit happens. And it while that's not saying that you shouldn't address what went wrong. Obviously, if shit goes wrong like that, it needs to be discussed. You need to figure out how to fix it for next time. But once you do, you need to assess like, okay, are are we are we good to like keep going, or do we need right. to take a little break? Because yeah, because cool. definitely if you just like slam keys when you're all tilted, mm -hmm. it's going to be bad. Sounds, that's good advice. Um, all right, let's switch gears. I, I would love to kind of look forward a little because I, I have, I've heard, um, you know, obviously I've, I've looked in your stream, I've heard your opinions about, you know, how a fixer should be. But before we get there, I think there's been a lot of chatter about how, you know, the idea about keys depleting and dropping a level is kind of punishing to like the majority of the player base. Like, What's your take on this? Like, do you think breaking a key resulting in, you know, a, a drop in key level is something that, you know, Blizzard should keep going forward? Like, I would love to kind of get like, you know, high-end players taught on this. Yikes. <laughs> I was worried you were going to ask oh, me this sheesh. because uh, <laughs> this is this is actually one of the most like controversial right? topics because I know, I know for a fact that a lot of people think that... Keystones should not deplete. Yeah, but if you I, sticks, right? The sticks are important because the fact that it depletes, it gives it meaning, I guess. But yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt yeah. you. Yeah, right I'm not 100% sure where I stand on it is the truth because I think that... I think that depleting keys feels too punishing right now. Right. I will agree with that. Mm. However, I also think that... I also think that keys, while depleting feels too punishing, I think that if you were to remove depletion entirely, that the adrenaline that I would get from timing like world first keys would be significantly lessened mm -hmm. because you would just get to try it like 10 times, you know? And then it would just be about who can... It, it puts less importance on the key itself. Right. So the key to like, it, you know, if you're really close and you're like, oh my God, we might deplete this. It's like, whatever, we'll just run it again. You know, in, instead of mm -hmm. currently where it's like, you, you have to put every single last drop of effort into every global to make sure that you time that key or else you're, you know. Right. So I think there's some sort of in between where you could have a depletion system that's less punishing, but doesn't just allow you to run a dungeon an infinite amount of times. Mm. One idea with that would be maybe you could have charges right. on the keystones. So you could have like each keystone could have two or three charges and then it would deplete, you know? Right. I would probably lean towards two. I think three might be not great. I think two would be pretty reasonable. But that being said, like I really am not sure what the best solution is. I think... I think that's something that uh, I don't really have a strong opinion on either way. Right. All right, cool. Um, how about the fixes? Looking forward into the war within, obviously I think season four would be kind of, I don't think they'll try anything crazy, but talk to me about the fixes. You've seen all these seasons now um, and you've been playing since Legion. What do you think is kind of the direction that Blizzard should take for fixes? Like seasonal fixes, is it a good idea? Should there not be seasonal fixes? Like, what's your thoughts on this? So this is something I do have strong opinions yep, about. I've seen and those I've been now. very, I've been very vocal about this with a lot of different uh, players when they've talked to me about this. In my opinion, I think the current affix system is really bad. I think that affixes are not something that players are excited about in terms of like making the dungeons unique i think that players are just it's it's it in my opinion affixes should be like the response to affixes should be "Ooh, what affixes do we get to play with this week mm. but instead it's oh god what affixes do we have this week what you know well said what awful things do i have to deal with this week and i think that that's a fundamental flaw with affixes mm. um 
in my opinion, the change of dungeons from having one set of dungeons the entire expansion versus now where we have a rotating set of dungeons and a new pool every single season, I think that alone has done a, a lot to lessen the requirement of affixes. Because before, when dungeons were a full expansion long, you needed affixes in order to create variants from, you know, so that things didn't just get stale all the time. And so I definitely saw affixes value a little bit more. But now we have new dungeon pools every season. I think the requirement of affixes should be lessened significantly. And I know that they started nerfing affixes, but in my opinion, we're still at a point of just having too many affixes right. um, that rotate from week to week. And there's a lot of affixes that are still incredibly unfun to play around. Right. Now, I've had many different suggestions over the years for how to fix this. One of them is introducing positive affixes. So right now, we have a system of uh, two rotating weekly affixes plus... Um, fortified or tyrannical, mm -hmm. depending on the week. So, And, and fortified and tyrannical uh, rotate from week to week. Right. So for me, what I would like to see, uh, or one option is that you could, instead of having two negative weekly affixes, you have one negative and one positive. And that way, you know, and, and the positive could be anything. It could be like, you know, increased move speed. You could uh, heal for a percentage of, you know, damage done. You could have like, uh, things that could turn your group invisible right. and allow you to like skip certain things. There's a lot of different things that you could do with positive affixes. And I don't really know what that would look like because I haven't really fleshed out a lot of positive affix ideas. But I do think that having, having all these negative affixes yeah. just makes the whole system feel really bad. Right. Uh, that being said, you could also do affixes. Uh, I think my best suggestion currently for the way to change affixes is to remove one of the weekly affixes entirely. So right now we have two weekly affixes. We have an easy set of affixes, which are the ones like volcanic, um, bursting, uh, not quaking anymore. Um, but yeah, we, yep. you have the easy set of affixes and then you have the hard set of affixes, which is stuff that everyone hates. Incorporeal, afflicted, bolstering, sanguine, those types of things. And I say you just get rid of all the ones that people hate and use and then have your the easier ones be rotated on a weekly basis. Mm -hmm. And then you have one weekly affix, you have fortified and tyrannical, and then you have uh, seasonal. I would like them to bring seasonal back. And right. the reason I think seasonal should come back, it's actually for a few reasons. One is that seasonal affixes gave uh, a lot of flavor to the season like it it as much as some of the affixes were not great it always made the season feel unique right and that was one of the things i really loved and it always played into the the theme of the season mm -hmm. you know like with razageth you had thundering and um i i think that i really really liked the whole thematic seasonal affix thing even if some of the affixes were not very good right um i think that they should bring back seasonal affixes, but they should be a little bit more focused on in terms of like tuning. Mm. Like you should make sure that because like thundering is a good example of an affix right. that could have been cool, but they didn't put enough focus on the punishment of thundering and how frustrating it was. Right. Uh, they could have tuned it and made it a lot more reasonable and it would have been a pretty cool affix. But I think they they dropped the ball a little bit on the tuning on that. Do you mean like and the stun is too punishing, or like do you think you should yeah, be a debuff? The, All right, go the ahead. stun the stun was too punishing. Uh, it often just meant that your group wiped, especially if a tank got stunned. There were a lot of different things they could have done to thundering, but I'm not going to go too far into specifics. I right. kind of just want to keep things general. And for that reason, I think uh, I think seasonal affixes would be really cool. One of the things I loved about seasonal affixes were most of the seasonal affixes were kiss curse. Mm. And what kiss curse means is you had a positive side of the affix and a negative side. So when like, for example, encrypted, you had to kill the mobs and the mobs were dangerous, but killing the mob would give you a really cool buff. Right. And so things like that, where it's like, it's a negative and a positive, 
I really, really love that about seasonal affixes. Now, I don't think that you could bring Kiss Curse style into weekly rotational affixes because it would just be too much shit going on. So I understand why Blizzard doesn't want to do Kiss Curse for standard affixes. But I think that's one of the things that made seasonal affixes so fun and unique. And like when people look back on seasons with good seasonal affixes, they look back very, very fondly. And I think when people look back on these seasons, which don't have seasonal affixes, they don't think as fondly. Um, so I think if you're able to put out good seasonal affixes, which I think Blizzard would be more than capable of doing right. if they, you know, just uh, pay a little bit more attention after release to how things are going and, and maybe try to be a little more, more aggressive with the tuning on the, the affix. Um, and I think if they can do that, that seasonal affix has brought something really, really cool to M plus that I would love to see return, which is both, uh, you know, thematic yeah. stuff for the season and a kiss curse style affix that you could play around for the whole season, right. which I, I think is really cool. Plus, if you have that seasonal affix, then you can take away one of the weekly affixes, which is going to make it so that every week there aren't such big gaps between weeks. Because right now you have some gap, some you know weeks where you've got bolstering sanguine or something. And it's just like unplayable. Right. And then you've got other weeks, which is just like volcanic bursting or something. Mm -hmm. And it's a complete joke. And so, or at least, yeah. And, and so I think finding... Uh, I think removing one of those weekly affixes would go a long way in terms of player frustrations with affixes. It gives you less to have to deal with on a week-to-week -week basis, and you can focus a little bit more on the dungeons. Because that's the thing, is that affix, affixes are meant to keep the dungeons fresh. Mm. But I think with new dungeons coming in every season, that's already kind of being accomplished. Right. Uh, plus, you would have a seasonal affix, which would make things feel fresh. Uh and then you would still have one weekly rotating affix and you'd have fortified and tyrannical. So you'd still have a lot of variance from week to week. I think that would be more than enough while being able to put a little bit more emphasis back into the dungeons themselves, which I think would be really good for the player base. Right. And, um, and just going off like what you're talking about, like it does sound like you're okay with fortified and tyrannical staying. Like I, I think there's been a lot of talks about removing tyrannical, but where do you stand on this no. debate? Uh, I am not okay with them staying, but... I have also accepted that Blizzard loves Fortified and Tyrannical, mm. and there's almost no chance they're going to get rid of them. Right. And the reason for that is while Fortified and Tyrannical sucks at the world first skill levels, yeah. it's really good for like the average key level mm. that is played. Like People have to remember that the majority of players playing this game are playing it at a key level that is low enough that Fortified and Tyrannical makes you place... Like it, it, it allows you to focus a little bit more on trash one week and a little bit more on bosses this week. But it doesn't create this ridiculous marathon of like seven minute bosses that that just loop the same mechanic that are all like one shot mechanics. Like there, the frustrations with tyrannical all come from higher key levels, mm. which is understandable. But I think what Blizzard needs to do is curb the scaling of tyrannical and fortified as the key level gets higher. So. I think what you'd want to do is curb it so that it, it's like a third of what it is currently at the highest key level, right. but then offset that by buffing dungeon scaling, mm. uh, like baseline, so that at high key levels, there's a lot less of a ridiculous variance between trash mobs and bosses, but you're still getting a much more challenging dungeon that requires a lot more throughput because the baseline level of the mob's health and damage is getting scaled but it's scaling evenly both trash and bosses. So that would allow less of a, like you would have less of a just insane tyrannical, right. like seven minute bosses that everything one shots, but you would still get an increase in difficulty and, a, and requirement of, you know, so, and I think that would kind of solve both worlds where you would be able to maintain the variance at lower key levels without making it a disaster for high key levels. Right. Cool. That's a that's an elegant solution. Um, you know, thanks for sharing that. Um, and I kind of want to loop back to, uh, you know, just changing gears here away from affixes because I know you can talk about affixes all day and and, uh, and we we'll we'll not go there for now. Um, but I kind of latched on to what you spoke about earlier about um how you know people who play WoW generally we are introverts and you know some of us we're not out there and often. But I know that this time around BlizzCon this was your first BlizzCon and you know getting to meet. All your fans like kind of talk to us like how how does that feel it was surreal for me like um 
I, I, I definitely have imposter syndrome where I feel like I don't really belong uh, in that same like echelon of players um, when it comes to like, you know, rank one world players. And like, I, for me, I've never really felt like I've belonged or deserved to be in that scene despite my accomplishments. And so I think going to BlizzCon and, and seeing you know, all my fans and having people like come up to me and, and talk to me and like thank me. And uh, I think that it was really healthy for my mental to make me feel like a little bit more accepted in the scene and a little bit more like I do belong to be here. And, you know, I've worked really hard to get here and, and you know, I, I do deserve some recognition. And so I think that was really good for me in terms of uh, my mental and, and understanding and trying to like curb my imposter syndrome a little bit and accept that I have succeeded in a lot of areas in WoW and I've helped a lot of people and that means a lot to me. So I'd just like to thank everyone who, you know, came up to me at BlizzCon. You guys definitely made my year. I just like to echo that because I feel like, um, and, and I look on a lot of like WoW streamers as kind of Twitch and you are probably one of the most calm and kind of wholesome people, even when it comes to like high tension moments. Um, and I think it's very apparent. I think like that's why your community is so kind of, you know, that's why they're they're really into watching your stream. Um, and and I don't know how else to put it, but yeah, when I think about healers, I think about you. And, and you were one of the first few people I reached out to because I felt like, yeah, th that's that's a guy that, you know, he, he you, you are a really, really good player, but there's no errors about you. And that's what I think is cool about you. And I think your fans recognize that at BlizzCon. So kudos well, to you. Well, thank you. you. Yeah. I really appreciate you saying that. Right. That means a lot. Um, cool. And, and speaking about that, like obviously you went a bit into that already. Um, you know, before we wrap up, like, is there any particular shout outs? I know you already kind of talked about your community. Um, and, and also like, how can people best follow you, uh, your content? Um, yeah, like any shout outs and, and how can people follow you? Um, I guess my main shout out is just to my, you know, my viewers, my community. You guys have been absolutely amazing, so supportive and kind, and it's really meant so much to me over the years. Uh, I I really don't have the words to properly thank everyone, but just know that you're all loved and you're all very much appreciated. And as for following me, uh, you can follow me on Twitch, Ellismere underscore gaming. You can follow me on Twitter, Ellismere gaming, and YouTube as well. Um, but I don't post as much YouTube as I should. I really need to start. Your doing guys that. are awesome, dude. So um, just saying. We have, oh yeah, we have you can check out wingsisup.com also if you uh, if you want a guide for Holy Pally. It's one of the nicest design sites I've seen for like just a content creator doing something so specific for a spec. Just curious, like, do you have an aesthetic training background? Because I know you're a violinist, <laughs> I, right? I, I was a. Yeah. I was a. Yeah, I am a violinist, but I. Uh, as a career before streaming, I was a graphic designer, web designer. That explains. Uh, and did a lot of marketing, so. <laughs> your look, like your your brand, like even your logo and you know the colors that you use, like it's clearly well thought out and, and you don't see a lot of that from, from content creators. So um, to the people- well, Thank you. Yeah, for the people who haven't checked that out, naturally like we'll plug all your socials and your website in, in, the, in the description and the comments and, and you know, that's where they'll follow you. And before we wrap up, before I let you go, I know you're, you're busy and you're on stream. Before I let you go, just one question that people have been wanting me to ask you. When can we get the next violin performance from you? Because the last time you <laughs> released a video like that was I think BFA. So do we get another violin performance from you? <laughs> So uh, I did the violin concert back in BFA. Yeah, that was a long time ago. Um, and I wanted to do a part two, but the reality is that it requires like three to four weeks of, of wow. prep and like like eight hours a day work. Like it, it's a huge undertaking and I really want to do it, but I also haven't had the time to commit to it. That being said, I recently decided that I really wanted to try and do it, but because it's such a big undertaking, um, in terms of like the financial hit, because I can't stream when yeah, I do that. Sure. And streaming is my main source of income. So um, I put up some sub goals on my stream for the violin performance. And if we hit that, then I'm just going to commit to spending like a month uh, prepping for that and then putting that concert on. So that's awesome. So I guess, you know, to the people who keep asking me to ask this question, and there's a lot of them, by the way. So please, you know, <laughs> you know what to do. He has, the man has said it himself. 
go to his stream, support him and, and make the concert happen. So <laughs> yeah, thanks thanks so much for for, for all your time, Alasmia. Like I really appreciate it. Um, I know you're on stream, thank so, you so much, I will kind of let you go. Um, again, thank you so much for, you know, sharing. Um, and, you know, I just want to say like, it's it's a real pleasure talking to you because you you have no airs. You're one of the best players, but you, there's no airs about you. And, and I think there's a lot of stuff that people can learn from you in terms of the mental game. So yeah, thank you so much. Thanks for your time. And, of course, man. Thank you for having me. And I I'll really keep you posted that. when this this episode goes out. Awesome. Cool. All right. I hope you have a great day. Great. Great weekend, Alice Mia. See you soon. Take care. All right. See you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. And that's the episode. If you're looking for the uncut, unfiltered, unedited version of this podcast, everything is available to our Patreon subscribers. And speaking about Patreon subscribers, thank you to all the patrons that you see on screen. Thank you for making this possible. And if you can't get enough of insights from the world's best players in MMORPGs, you can check out the video in the middle of the screen. This features Arthur's one of the best Final Fantasy XIV players. We had a really fun chat about his experience being a Hall of Fame Raider in WoW versus his world first races in Final Fantasy XIV. Make sure to hit that subscribe button. The next guest is a massive figure. You don't want to miss that.